All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Comp 3430 Operating Systems. Uh, there's two classes left. There are two classes left in this course. There are two classes left in this course. Uh, there's a couple things I want to bring up before we get into today's stuff. Uh, the first thing is that the final exam schedule has finally been updated with rooms. And we are in 223 Wallace building. Do you all know where Wallace is? <laughs> Somebody's calling it Mario building and another person's calling it the weird building. Uh, it's the, <laughs> I like that description. It's the geology building. So it's like on the other side of campus. Uh, okay, okay. Do we all know where the Wallace building is? Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, this brings me to a total tangent of the registrar's office doing crazy things with, court, with room assignments this term. Uh, originally, they'd assigned software engineering to be in this room that you're in. They assigned this course to be in the human ecology building. So you, you would have had to like get up and walk all the way to human ecology after software engineering. Doesn't make any sense. This room was free. <laughs> it wasn't actually booked for anything. They just put us in a completely different building on the other side of campus. Anyway, that's where our final exam is going to be. Um, I'm going to go down there early and scope out what the room looks like so I can draw a map of what the seat numbers are going to look like. And uh, I will put that up on the course webpage when I send you the email with your with your paper assignment. So you should have a sense of what that's going to look like. And the other thing was that I kind of just wanted to answer a question. Just ignore those pictures, please. And the, the question that I want to answer is in the form of something that we were working on yesterday. So yesterday we were looking at that allocate you some memory, the memory allocation example. And the question was basically, if we've got uh, this big block of memory allocated here, something like this. So all of this is allocated. The amount of free space that we have is three units of free space. And we've got a request for malloc three. So let's say that we're at this point right here. What do we do in any of these cases? What do we do with any of these cases? With all of them, we've kind of got two options. One is just say no, because no, sorry, there is not enough contiguous free space for us to allocate this amount of memory, even though we technically have this many units of memory free, minus one, return minus one, I can't allocate this memory. The other option is to do what you did in that Comp 2160 assignment, compact things, shift everything up to the beginning so that you have one giant block of contiguous free space, or in this case, three units of contiguous free space so that you can satisfy that. This. Uh, compact operation, that's what it would have been called in your garbage collection assignment. This is technically called defragmentation. So this is a fragmented memory layout. We have free space that adds up to a certain amount, but it's scattered all over the place. Defragmenting is taking all of those free spaces and making it one big free space. I'm not gonna ask you to defragment if, if I'm going to ask you questions about allocation policies and free, free space management, I'm not going to ask you to defragment it as part of that. It's just going to be a, um, a happy path case of uh, allocation policy application as opposed to something that's going to be like in a weird state like this. Uh, the other thing that I want to do is, um, you know, I've got stuff that I've got planned for today. Again, just please ignore these pictures. Uh, I've got stuff that I got planned for today, but I'm also more than happy to just like open the floor for questions about the assignment, questions about the final exam for 10 or 15 minutes or so. 
Uh, if you have learning outcomes that you are looking at from earlier parts of the course that you have questions about, please feel free to ask them. I'll give you 30 seconds to think about questions unless you've got something right now and you wanna just jam your hand in the air and ask that question right away. Yes, please. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay, so I'm going to try to break this question up into a few different parts. Um, I'm going to go to the EXFAT documentation here, and I'm going to search for a uh, no fat chain. So this is uh, a bit that's set on one of those um, generic general primary flags or general secondary flags attributes that's in different kinds of directory entries. And this says you don't have to build a fat chain for this file or directory. So there's a question before class. This can be true for files and directories because they both have this attribute. They both have this attribute. Um, the only time you're going to find this property is in a situation where you're not looking at the root directory. The root directory is the only directory that you absolutely 100% all of the time have to create a cluster chain for it. That's the only one. Every other directory that you're finding, every other file that you're finding, you are starting to go through the process of building the cluster chain for that thing because you found an entry set for it in directory entries. So in the case of, I'm going to go through the process of starting to read an entry set from a directory, you have to read this property before you can even start building the cluster chain for that thing, because it's part of the directory entries that you're reading. So as soon as you see this, you can make the decision of, I don't have to build a cluster chain for this. So this, this should happen before you've even started building the cluster chain for the thing that you're trying to read through. When you're reading the directory entries, the only directory, so like I said, the only directory that you must build a cluster chain for is the root directory. And that's because it doesn't have any of these fields or properties. It's just something that you get from the, the main boot sector. Yeah. You probably need to build a cluster chain for like large files, right? Like the big ones? Maybe. <laughs> uh, maybe. So you're gonna you're going to find when you read the entry set for that file whether this is set or not. A large file like that, because I added it at the very end, it almost certainly doesn't have a fat chain. I can't guarantee that, but it almost certainly doesn't have a fat chain because it was the last file I added to the volume, and there's still this massive chunk of free space that's at the end of the volume when I'm adding files to it. When it says it does not have a fat chain, does that mean that it will like necessarily be in one cluster, it, but, or it will be in two cluster? It means that it's in contiguous clusters. Yeah, so for the 14 megabytes or whatever that that video is, um, it's going to be like, it starts at this cluster and it's got this much data length that's from the stream extension, from the stream extension. And then once you have those two properties, if no fat chain is set, you can just read from the beginning of the cluster for that file to that data length. And then that's it for the read operation. You don't have to build the cluster chain for it. Yeah. Oh, so hex dump is a program that will just print out a binary file in a hexadecimal representation. Um, 
the way that I use hex dump is, uh, so let me pop open my terminal here and I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger. So C file. So when I'm using hex dump, I'm using it for, in, in something like this, um, I do hex dump minus C, and then I will pass in the name of the file that I'm trying to dump out, and then I'll pipe it into something like less, a page viewer. The dash C option says print this out in a format that looks like this, and it gives you this table on the side that shows you an ASCII representation of what those characters could be. And so you can see right away here, this is the um, the file system name property in the main boot sector, that exfat dash dash under uh, space space space. The other way that you can use hex dump uh, to try and get to specific spots in the file, because that's something that you may want to do as you're like, I want to get to this cluster in the file. You have to calculate still what the offset is that you're trying to get to. Um, but you can use these uh, options dash S and dash N. And what these options do is skip this many bytes and then show you this many bytes. So this will take you to a location in the file and then the first things it's gonna print out are gonna be the bytes starting there. So if you're trying to find like the contents of a, a plain text file, because those will be ASCII formatted, and you know what the first cluster of that plain text file is, you can use this to, to, to verify that that's the right place for it. Yeah. 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 Sure. So if you were to make a file and directory entry, mm -hmm. in the file actually support the text that Yep. Yep. Yeah, they can be right alongside each other and they might even be like interleaved between each other. You might have a file and then a directory and then a file, but they're still contained within the same directory entry sets. Yeah. So the root directory, I, I think it's got five or six directories and then one file. And the way that tree is printing them out is that the file comes last and the directories come first, but that might not actually be what they look like when you're going through directory entries for the root directory. Yeah. Yeah, I'll still do that. Um, <laughs> at the risk of making it one hour long, I was thinking of going back through learning outcomes from the beginning of the course. I'm, I'm reluctant to do that though, because it would just turn into another lecture. <laughs> uh, maybe you're okay with that, I don't know, but um, okay, okay, okay. I also kind of just informally plan to start doing that tomorrow in class anyway. Um, the stuff that I have in the slides for today is the stuff that I plan to finish for the course. This is where we're going to end the course. So um, if there's time tomorrow, that's kind of my plan is just to start at the beginning and go through the learning outcomes, which might be the sim same thing or uh, the beginning of the weekly roundup, the, the, the termly roundup. I don't know what you call it, but yeah, yeah, to do some kind of a review sort of thing. Yeah. That said, if there are any specific questions about specific learning outcomes that you really want me to focus on tomorrow, please send me an email, post on the forum, to just let me know in some way and I can make sure that that happens. Um, I plan to have the exam finished by Friday and I'll make sure to let you know like what kind of coverage is going to be on there. I'm not gonna state necessarily specific learning outcomes, but I'll tell you, from the first half of the course, what's not going to be on the final, yeah, to help uh, focus your studying efforts.
Any other questions? All right. OK, I'll take one last question. What's up? They're all the same, yeah. They all have exactly the same files on them. All the same files, all the same directories. In the readme um, here, I wrote down the instructions. Like the, I was actually just copying and pasting these instructions out uh, as I was going through the process of making the volumes up. So this, how these volumes were made were like me actually writing this out and then copying and pasting from this file. So this is, this is just how I made them, and they were all made in the same way. They are all made in exactly the same way. Okay. All right, let's, uh, let's go back to the slides. Like I said, if you've got specific questions that you'd like me to take a look at tomorrow, please uh, pre prepare me so that I, that I know what you're, what you're looking for. Um, otherwise, let's get on with talking about some more virtual memory stuff. So by the end of today's lecture, what I'm hoping that you are able to do is uh, describe the concept of paging. So paging is another approach to doing virtual memory, to implementing virtual memory. And I want you to be able to describe that idea. I want you to be able to compare and contrast methods for address translation and implementing virtual memory. So taking a look at the concept of base and bounds, the concept of segmentation, and the concept of paging. How are these things the same? How are they different from each other? And I want you to be able to explain how paging solves the problems introduced with segmentation. So with base and bounds, we had this problem of internal fragmentation. There were big chunks of memory, physical memory, that were allocated but were not usable by other processes because they had been allocated to a process already. That was internal fragmentation. External fragmentation was introduced with segmentation. We may have space, enough space to put more things, but it's fragmented. It's scattered around and we don't have a big contiguous block that's free enough to put something. I want to take the time to, uh, to quickly go through the process of looking at base and bounds and segmentation and try to give you a sense of what it looks like when the CPU or the processor or the hardware, I will be the CPU, the processor, or the hardware in this case, is going through the process of doing address translations between virtual addresses with base and bounds virtual addresses with segmentation, and then physical addresses in uh, physical memory. These two problems are going, or these two solutions are trying to go through the process of making a process believe, and having a process believe something is really existential, so I don't want to say it that way. I want to make it so that processes can just have virtual addresses embedded within them so that I can take the same program and run it on my machine, the machine upstairs that's got a terabyte of memory, the machine that is in my pocket that's got, I, I don't know, I think this has got six gigs of memory. This is a bad example. Some smaller amount of memory. I want these all to work the same way. I want them all to work the same way with the same program without having to go and change all of the addresses in that program. So I've got this diagram here. There's a lot that's going on. There's a lot of moving parts, but I just want to take the time to step through what I've got here and what we're going to be trying to solve with each of these two problems. There's stuff that's common across both of these solutions for implementing virtual memory. The stuff that's common across both of these is our virtual address space here. Our virtual address space, we went through the process of trying to see like what does a process see we ran a C program that prints out addresses. We took a look at that maps file to see where these different parts of our program were laid out in virtual memory. In all of these cases, we have a code section in virtual memory. And the code section here has virtual addresses. The code section has virtual addresses that in this case start at 
virtual address zero. So every program that we're running in our little hypothetical virtual address space, every program always has a starting address of zero, virtual address of zero, and that's where our code segment lives. Within that, within this virtual address space, we've got this sequence of instructions in our code section, and those sequence of instructions will have, each, each of them will have their own address. They're gonna be at a location in memory in virtual address space. Our processor or our hardware is going to have this program counter idea, a register, and this program counter is going to be, this is the next instruction that needs to be fetched from memory, and this is what's going to be executed next. The state that we're in in virtual memory right now is that this sequence of instructions has run already. This is a call. We've called something like printf, and we've just returned from that. And we're now about to fetch this move instruction. We need to go through the process of fetching this move instruction from memory, and then, then go through the process of executing that instruction. So that's the state that we're in right now in our virtual address space. This is going to be true for both base and bounds and segmentation. They both have the same virtual state underneath them. On the operating system side of things, the two differ, but they only differ like in the number of things that they have. They have the same concept of things, but they've just got different numbers of those concepts. With base and bounds, we're gonna look at this physical memory layout right now. With base and bounds, we are physically segmenting physical memory into fixed size chunks, fixed size blocks. And within each of those fixed size blocks, we're putting an entire address space. With base and bounds, our operating system has to keep track of Globally, it has to keep track of which of these are used, which have been allocated, and which are not allocated. So it could use something like a bitmap for that, an allocation structure. For each process that's running, it's got to keep track of the base and the bounds. So where in physical memory does this start, and where in physical memory does this end, or how much of an offset does this thing have? In my example here, I've got this as a mistake. I've got this as a mistake. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, this is supposed to be 8 kilobytes. So this should be a 2 instead of a 3. And this should be 8120. 8192, there we go. So within our operating system, within the process control block for this process, we've got where this starts in physical memory. Our operating system knows about physical memory. It knows about actual physical addresses. It knows what's allocated. It knows what's not allocated in actual physical memory. It knows that. This process that's running here starts at physical memory location 1000, 0x1000, and it ends at 0x2000. With segmentation, we have the same general idea, except we have these base and bounds for all of the segments of our virtual address space. So base and bounds, we physically separated physical memory into these fixed size chunks. Segmentation, we're separating our virtual address space into fixed size chunks and then stuffing them into memory just wherever they fit because the segments that we're allocating in physical memory can be different sizes. We're only allocating as much as is necessary. With segmentation, our operating system in the process control block has to keep track of where does the code segment go? The code segment is the segment of virtual memory that starts at address zero. So all of the addresses in the code segment are going to start with zero, zero for bits. 
it needs to keep track of where's the heap segment in physical memory. And in our virtual address space, all of the addresses for the heap segment start with address 01. It needs to keep track of this third weird segment that doesn't have a label. We're just going to ignore that. And we need to keep track of our stack at the bottom. And at the bottom of our address space, when we're breaking this virtual address space up into four chunks, these are all of the addresses in our virtual address space that start with 1-1. One, one. For each of these segments, we have to keep track of where does this start, the base, and how big is it right now, the bounds. Conceptually, it's the same thing. It's the same thing, but we've got four that we're keeping track of in our PCB instead of just one, instead of just one. In physical address space now, in physical memory with segmentation, we're only allocating as much as is necessary for each of these different segments that we have in this process at any given time. So the code segment here is only 200 units of memory big, so it's quite small up there. We don't actually have to allocate that much space for it. The, the heap segment is about twice as big as the actual required space for the code segment, so it's a little bit bigger up there. The stack segment is twice as big as that, so it should be a little bit bigger than that when we're actually allocating in physical memory. So that's the state that we're in in physical memory here. That's the state that we're in in our operating system side. This is the state that we're in with our virtual memory layout. To go through the process of me, I'm the hardware, I'm the CPU, I'm the memory management unit, I need to fetch the next instruction. My program counter is set as a virtual address in the virtual address space for this process. The next instruction that I need to fetch here is at 0x0004. So at the very top of this address space, this is the fourth instruction that I want to fetch. With base and bounds, it's as simple as let's take the virtual address and then just add that to the bounds. So for base and bounds, for me, the MMU, the CPU, the hardware, whatever you want to call me, to find this move instruction that's in our virtual address space at address four, to find this physical copy of it, or this physical place in actual physical memory where it is, I need to go through the process of saying the virtual address, the virtual address, which for that move instruction, what's in my program counter right now, 0x0004. And I need to add to that plus the, uh, the base for this process. My operating system, when it switches this process on, it's going to set a register the base register for this process. So as the MMU, as the CPU, I'm going to have this base, which is 0x1000, it's at 4K. And to get that physical address, I just add those two things together. And that takes me to physical location 0x1004. That's in this code segment up here. I can fetch the instruction from physical memory now. I can decode the instruction, figure out what I need to do, determine if there's memory addresses in the offerands of this instruction, or if it's all just literals and registers, I can just run the instruction. So for base and bounds, all we're doing is, let's just take the virtual address, add the base. We should check to see that we haven't gone past the bounds of this thing, I'm not trying to read memory that's in this other physical memory location for another process. If that happens, raise a fault. Tell the operating system, you do something about it. Somebody's tried to go past their bounds. With segmentation, the approach is similar. It's similar. As we switch this process on, I'm going to stop. Are there questions about this base and bounds? We're OK with that? Okay. Yeah. 
seems like smaller than the actual text you see right here as well. The code section for the segmentation versus base and bounds, the same amount of code would be in both of those. Uh, and they would be allocated in the same way. So like, I didn't draw it to scale, I'm sorry. <laughs> but in the physical memory here, our code section would probably be similar or the same as the code section as in segmentation. Yes, yeah, yeah. Where the difference is that we've still allocated the entire chunk with base and bounds, whereas with segmentation, we've only allocated the code segment for that one. Yeah. OK. OK, so with segmentation, similar to base and bounds, base and bounds, our, our hardware is going to give control to the operating system. The scheduler takes over. The scheduler says, this process gets to run next. I'm going to set registers, base and bounds, for the MMU or for the CPU so that it can do those virtual to physical translations for me. With segmentation, is the same idea as that, except I'm not just setting one set of base and bounds registers. I'm going to set three or four sets of base and bounds registers. The base and bounds registers that I'm setting are going to be, these are the prefixes of the addresses that you should use or that you will find. When you find the prefix of this address, these are the values that you should use to calculate what the physical location is and what the bounds of that segment are going to be. So with segmentation, we're going to do something similar. Our program counter now says the next instruction that you need to execute is at virtual address 0x0004. So it starts with a prefix of addresses at 00. zero. This is the first two bits, the first two bits, not the first two bytes, but the first two bits of this address. The first two bits of this virtual address tell me that I need to use this as the base for my calculation. So this would be like some kind of a table that I've got in physical memory. I'm not a hardware person. I'm not sure what this would actually look like in, in memory. Uh, take comp 3370 if you want to start to see what this looks like. Or don't. <laughs> or don't. This would look kind of like a table. Maybe there's some AND gates. I don't really know. I'm not a hardware person. We take a look at this table. The virtual address that we're trying to decode here starts with the 2-bit 0, 0. So we're going to look at the base and the bounds registers that have been set for addresses that start with 0, 0. To calculate that, we're still going to use this approach. The virtual address is 0x0004. We're still going to use a sum operation, but the base that we're using this time is now the base for prefix 0, 0. And the base for prefix 0, 0 with this physical memory layout is 0x0924. And the sum of those is going to be 0x0928. OK, good. Basic sums, good, yes. Our hardware, our MMU, is going to say, is this address that I've just calculated bigger than 200 past the start? In this case, no, it's fine. It will then fetch that instruction, put it onto the CPU. The CPU will decode the instruction and kind of go through that whole process again, try to decide if there's more uh, memory addresses that it needs to refer to. The stack, I'm going to leave out of this discussion intentionally, very intentionally. I am leaving this out of the discussion right now. I'm very intentionally leaving this out of the discussion right now. The stack is weird. Stack is real weird with segmentation because it's like an offset from the bottom of the stack as opposed to the top of the stack because the stack grows upwards instead of downwards like everything else does. But I'm really intentionally leaving that discussion out of this right now. I'm very intentionally leaving that discussion out. Do we all understand what I mean by that? 
I am very intentionally leaving that part of virtual address translation out for segmentation. OK, I am very intentionally leaving that out. It's weird because it's this reverse locate, reverse uh, sum. You kind of have to take the base of the stack, subtract it from the size of the stack, and then use that as the beginning of the offset to calculate the address into the stack that you're trying to find in physical memory location. Don't worry about it. Just don't even worry about it. We found the address in the code section. We're good. We're good. We found the address in the code section. The whole purpose of this virtual address space stuff and virtual memory layout and why we're doing this address translation is because this is happening underneath the covers. Our processes, everything that we've ever written looks like this to us and it looks like that to the process. It's got this virtual memory layout. We can rely on this virtual memory layout. We don't, we don't have to care what physical memory looks like. Our operating system cannot allocate multi-terabyte address spaces. So we're limited to having segments or in reality paging with what we're going to look at in a second. But I still don't want to have to rewrite all those programs that rely on this virtual address layout. I want to let my hardware deal with that and let my operating system deal with that. Yeah, Rosen. Possibly is it so is it extra is is the one that I've crossed out here, this one zero. I've separated this into four segments. Is this then just like extra space for the heap or the stack? Maybe. In this case, it's probably not allocated at all, and it's just never going to be used for anything. In reality, in practice, uh, going back to our memory allocator discussion, with uh, BRK and SBRK, we actually only have two segments instead of four segments. We have the code heap segment and the stack segment. And then there's nothing in the middle that's unallocated because it's just addresses that start with zero and addresses that start with one. Yeah. Uh, so we have to add. We have to add these together first because in this case, we're starting with the code segment, but it could be that I'm accessing something that's on the heap or the stack that's way at the bottom. So if I just check to see if, if the address that was in the stack was past 1024, that wouldn't necessarily reflect what I'm trying to look for because the addresses that are in the stack are like between three kilobytes and four kilobytes. They'd be at something that's bigger than this already. So we have to do the add operation to decide what the address is and then check to see if that's still within the bounds of the, uh, of the originally stated segment. It's checking to see if it has been allocated. So checking to see if it's allocated, the only thing that the hardware is able to do is check to see if it's within the bounds that were stated here. Our operating system is what's actually keeping track of all of these different processes, because every process will have this set of registers, which are allocated to which process. So that when, for example, this process calls exit, it's going to release all these segments in physical memory so that other processes can run there. OK, OK, yeah. Yeah. That's a fair question. So the question, I'm going to try to summarize it and make sure that I'm saying the right thing. Your question is, does the segment size change if it's out of bounds on request? And so, OK, so no, it doesn't change. The hardware can't change it. The hardware doesn't actually know anything about what's allocated and what's not allocated. The only thing that the hardware knows is that you told it where to start and how big it can be. If you want to grow your heap or if you want to grow your stack, you have to make special OS calls like BRK or SBRK. 
So those system calls, in terms of what they're changing about the process control block, when I call SBRK, what I'm actually asking is, can you please change this to be bigger? This is, this is my heap segment. Please make this bigger for me. Maybe you're gonna change this because maybe there's just not enough space to grow that heap down anymore. So maybe you move my heap somewhere else and you change this, but BRK and SBRK are really just asking, hey, can you please change the size of my segment? That's explicitly on the part of the code itself. I need more memory, please. Please change the size of my heap. It's on a process that's asking for it to happen. So neither the OS nor the hardware are going to change those sizes on their own. Yeah. Um, the, the way that we're figuring out which segment it is that's using the first two bits yeah. isn't necessarily like how it is, right? Like how it, like all, there's like other ways to do it too, right? Other than using the first two bits. For segmentation? For finding out which segment um, like the virtual address is associated with. To figure out what the physical address is associated with, with the virtual address, what other ways would you do? Because in the textbook they have like the linking closer of the code and like an input to the code. Oh right. Um, so to like finding out like which like should it just like subtract or just use for the Yeah, so there's an ex the, the explicit approach is like there are named registers basically, and the implicit approach is this this way, if I'm remembering that correctly. So if I'm remembering that correctly, <laughs> if I'm remembering that correctly, I'm going to go back and make sure that I write it down correctly, but this is the approach that I care about. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? We're okay? Okay. So this whole idea of virtual to physical address translation is what we're accomplishing here. The main problems that we've got right now is that base and bounds, by allocating the entire virtual address space, one, we get internal fragmentation. There's this chunk in the middle that's allocated but not usable by anybody else. Two, we can only have virtual address spaces that are smaller than physical memory. So even though we have may maybe lots of free space outside, there's only one process running at this time, there are other spots that we could use. We can't make virtual address space bigger. We're just limited to what we've got. So base and bounds doesn't work very well for those two reasons. Segmentation improves upon that by only allocating as much as is necessary, but it adds some complexity and uh, we have external fragmentation. So outside of the allocated chunks, there's free space, but it might not be the right shape or size. I won't be able to put a new code segment in between the code and the heap segment that I've already allocated in this case. There's just not enough room to put another stack, for example, for another process. So this is not allocated, but I still can't use it for anything. So this is external fragmentation. It's not allocated, it's in between spaces that are allocated, but I can't use it for anything. Paging takes the ideas of base and bounds and segmentation and kind of tries to smash them together a little bit, but it also looks a whole lot like a file system. It looks a whole lot like a file system. With paging, our approach is instead of having segments in our virtual address space that are fixed in size that we only allocate as much as is necessary, and instead of having just let's break physical memory into different size or into same size chunks, let's do both. Let's separate physical memory into fixed size chunks that are significantly smaller than an address space. So I'm not just allocating four kilobytes at a time in my big address space. I'm allocating 512 bytes or like 1K, something quite small. But also separate virtual address space into the same size chunks. Break them both apart into the same size of chunks that are fixed in size. 
when we want to allocate something, we can just look at all of the pages in physical memory that we've got. They're all fixed size. They are either allocated or not allocated. With cluster heap, we've got clusters that are allocated or not allocated. We just refer to the bitmap and say which one's free. I'm going to use that one now. With blocks, with VSFS, we say, hey, we've got these blocks in our file system that are all the same size. And I can look at my allocation bitmap and I can say, hey, which of these is free? I'm going to use that one. It's allocated now and I cannot use it for anything else. With paging, we've got physical memory that are all fixed size page frames, page frames, page frames that are all the same size, that are either allocated or not allocated. And I can have a structure, an allocation structure that says these ones are free. And I can just find one that's free and it's either free to use or it's not free to use. With segmentation, we had to go through the process of finding something that's big enough. We had to use these allocation policies, these free space management policies. With paging, we just fix the size and it's either allocated or it's not allocated. And we do the same thing with our virtual address space and we just stuff parts of our virtual address space into physical memory when we can find something that is free. I'm going to draw pictures of this, but Taking this approach minimizes internal fragmentation. With base and bounds, we had that big gap in the middle, allocated but not used and not usable. With clusters and blocks and file systems, there can be internal fragmentation, but it's minimized. It's minimized to the amount of internal fragmentation is like up to the block size, and that's it. So you might waste 4K or 4095 bytes if you have a one byte file, but bah, who cares when you've got gigabytes and gigabytes of memory. There's still internal fragmentation in this approach, but it's minimized compared to allocating the entire address space. We've eliminated external fragmentation because everything is a fixed size chunk. Everything's fixed size. It's either allocated or it's not allocated. You don't have the problem of, can I find a space that's big enough for this thing that I'm trying to allocate? You will either find it or you will not find it. And that's it. Let's draw some pictures to get a sense of what this looks like compared to segmentation and compared to base and bounds. I'm going to switch over to my tablet here. I'm just going to draw this on the same document so that they're going to be posted up at the same in the same PDF file. Paging, I'm going to switch to a different color pen. Red pen makes it seem like paging is really angry. Paging I'm going to have a virtual address space, and I'm going to have physical memory. My virtual address space and my physical memory are both going to look pretty much the same as what we've seen before. I'm going to draw this jagged edge at the bottom that says this just keeps going on after that. On the left side, the left side, I've got my virtual address space. And on the right, I've got physical memory. The first half of paging is let's take our virtual address space and break that into fixed size chunks. So logically separate this virtual address space into chunks that are all the same size. The address space that I've got here is going to start at 0, and it's going to go to 64. Unlike segmentation, we're not going to be breaking this up based on the different segments that we have in this virtual address space. We are just going to blindly separate it at four spots. We're just going to blindly separate it at four different spots. 
So it's going to look kind of similar to what we had with segmentation. I've got four fixed size chunks of memory. The way that I'm separating these fixed size chunks out is that the first thing that I've got, this is page zero, these are all addresses that start with zero, zero. The second part of virtual memory that I've got, page one, these are all addresses that start with zero, one. The third page that I've got, page two, these are all addresses that start with one, zero. And the last one, page three, these are all addresses that start with one, one. Our virtual address space is still laid out the same way that it was before, though. So within my virtual address space, I still have a code segment. And I'm going to draw it here. I still have a heap. And I'm going to draw it here. So it kind of spans across these two pages. And I still have a stack. at the bottom of my address space. This is different already a little bit from segmentation. When we were first looking at segmentation, our heap segment started at addresses that start with, one, uh, with 0, 1. It started in that second segment. Here, with paging, we actually don't we don't care about what's in those places in virtual memory. We don't care. We're separating all addresses at the virtual address space, regardless of what's inside them. We don't care about what's inside them. We're just separating our addresses up into four different parts. Physical memory is going to be broken apart in the same kind of way. I'm going to have physical memory broken up into fixed size chunks that are the same size as what I've got in my virtual address space. So I'm going to write here that this is starting at address 0, and this is going up to 64 four down here, and then it just keeps going on after that, so we can have other processes running in this system. We're taking our physical memory, and we're breaking it up into these chunks that are the same size as the pages that we have over here. And then what we're doing is taking these pages from our virtual address space and we're just kind of stuffing them into these page frames. So this is page frame zero. This is page frame one. This is page frame two. With physical memory, we're not breaking it up by addresses that are prefixed by something. That's not what we're doing. We're just breaking it up into the same size as the page pages that we have in virtual address space. These will have a size. The size of our virtual address space will then kind of inform how big the pages are. And then we'll make page frames in our physical memory the same size as that. We're going to have more or fewer page frames than we have pages, but that's OK. It's kind of the same idea as segmentation. We can have more physical memory than there is virtual address space, or less physical memory than there is virtual address space. To keep track of this, our operating system and our hardware are working together. And what they are keeping track of is in the PCB, 
our operating system is keeping track of these translations in a linear page table. Do we, we all know what table as a data structure is? It's an array, it's an array of things. It's an array of things. A table is a fancy way to say it's an array of things. A linear page table is a, a table that consists of page table entries. And page table entries can have lots of things, but the main thing that they encode is I've got a table. This half of the table is my index. I'm going to write IDX here. This half of the table is my index. And what we keep track of in this page table is where each of these pages are in physical memory. So the index in my page table here corresponds to the page number that I've got in my virtual address space. Page zero of my virtual address space is currently at page frame two in physical memory. Page one is allocated. So I'm going to allocate it. It's part of the heap. The, the heap is in here. I'm going to allocate this over here at page frame zero. Page three is allocated, and I'm going to allocate it here at page frame three. So coincidentally, the same, the same number that we have for, for our page. So page one is allocated over at page frame zero. Page two is not allocated. This page table entry says null. This is not actually allocated anywhere. And page three is allocated at page frame three. So this half here, this is our page number. This half here is our page frame number, where it is in physical memory. When we were doing base and bounds and segmentation here, the way that our OS was working with our hardware was to say, when I'm switching on this process for base and bounds, I'm just going to set these two registers. These are protected registers. So I've like mode switched into my OS mode. I'm allowed to set these registers. I've set the registers. I mode switch back to user mode. I let the process take over. And the hardware is going to dutifully do all of these translations by doing this quick sum. With segmentation, I did kind of the same thing. We get the mode switch. I have special permission to change those registers. I do the mode switch again, let the user process take over. The hardware dutifully goes through the process of translating these addresses from virtual addresses to physical addresses by doing the sum, by calculating the sum of those two values. With paging a linear page table, has to be as big as our virtual address space is. We've got to have as many entries as there are pages in our virtual address space. That's not going to fit in a register. It doesn't fit in a register. It does not fit in a register. The page table itself is in physical memory, is stored in physical memory. Our operating system is going to have some part of physical memory that's reserved for it. It's going to have its own special spot where it keeps things like process control blocks. Part of the process control block for a process now is going to include a linear page table here. And what the uh, operating system is going to do when it does a context switch to this process that's running 
is it will say to the MMU, the hardware, the CPU, it's going to say, this is where the page table starts for this process. This is where the page table starts for this process. It's going to set a register. OS sets register. I'm going to write this down as page table base register, PTBR, page table base register. This is where it starts. This is where this starts in physical memory. When the hardware is going through the process of decoding a virtual address and translating it to a physical address, the job that it has is, I've got a physical address. We'll say we're doing the same kind of example as we were before. We have an address that's in the code segment. The code segment is completely contained within page zero. The hardware does not know or care that it's the code segment that it's decoding an address for anymore. All it knows is the virtual address for that thing that it needs to fetch next, the program counter, it starts with zero, zero, so it's in page zero. That's all it knows. When it decodes that zero, zero, the hardware is going to take a look at the page table base register. It will fetch from memory the entry in the page table that corresponds to page number zero. So we've got the program counter. We've got the page table base register. Our hardware has to issue a fetch of memory to find the page table entry for page zero for this process. It gets back a page table entry. And in this case, it is as small as two, but there's a bunch of other stuff in actual page table entries, like permissions and stuff. There's a bunch of other stuff in page table entries, but all we care about right now is two. The hardware gets this back, and now it says, okay, I know where the physical address for what was requested in this page exists. So now I'm going to fetch page number two, page frame number two from physical memory, and I'm going to go to the offset in page frame number two that corresponds to the rest of the address that I've just loaded. There's a bunch of extra moving parts here. There's a bunch, there's a bunch of extra moving parts here compared to segmentation and compared to base and bounds. But we've completely eliminated the problem of external fragmentation. We've completely eliminated it. When we're adding a new process to this system, when we're asking for more memory, our OS will have a global page table for page frames that says this one is allocated, this one is not allocated, this is allocated, this is not allocated. It just finds a free one and says, here you go. It will update the process control block. It will update the page table entries and say, that's the page that you've got now. That's the page frame that you've got. We do still have the problem of internal fragmentation. Maybe our stack for this process never gets as big as a page does. If it never gets as big as a page does, this much of a page frame this much of our page frame will be allocated to that process and not be usable by anybody else, but that's significantly smaller than the entire region between the heap and the stack that we had with base and bounds. So there's still some internal fragmentation, but we've minimized it compared to the other approaches that we had before. Any questions about that? So with segmentation, the, so that's a good question. Compared to internal, compared to segmentation with internal fragmentation. Segmentation up here 
Because we're only allocating as much as is necessary, we basically don't have internal fragmentation. There, there's still some, because when we call that SBRK, we're gonna change the size of the segment, and we may never use that part of it, but there's effectively very little internal fragmentation with segmentation. Our code segment is never gonna change in size. Our heap and our stack may change in size, but we're still only allocating as much as is necessary for those things. So with segmentation, we have a negligible amount of internal fragmentation. It might be there, but it's not worth thinking about. With paging, we have some internal fragmentation, but we're willing to make that trade off because free space management and allocation policies are expensive to do at the OS level. They're very expensive to do at our OS level as we're constantly adding and removing processes from the system. Doing all that free space management stuff is gonna take way longer than just find a free page and give it out. Yeah. That's fair. So in this case, our heap has already grown past a page boundary. And our heap started in page zero, like it was just physically jammed right up to our code segment. And then we just kept calling SBRK to grow that segment size. So we're still using this term segment internally, even though we're talking about pages. We kept growing our heap segment, and then it grew past the boundary of this page. When that happens, our OS is going to either receive a page fault from the hardware that says this hasn't been allocated, or our OS is gonna say, hey, this goes past the size of a page table entry here. We've gone past that page table entry. We've gone past the page boundary. Let's allocate another page for that process. And then all addresses here that start with 01 are going to be resolved by our hardware to be that's this page frame, that's where you should start looking up addresses. Similarly with the stack, if the stack were to keep growing up here into page two, we would just recognize this is now past the boundary of a page, so I need to allocate another page frame and put an entry in my page table for that page to page frame mapping. So let's say Yeah. So the stack and that page two, for example, be part of the page of heap and part of it be the stack, or would it all be a So that's a, that's a great question. If we get to this point, my stack actually grows up to here, and my heap starts growing down to here. Is it is it possible for us to have part of the heap into the same page as part of the stack? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely because our hardware doesn't know anything about the heap or the stack. Our operating system kind of barely cares about the heap or the stack. It kind of barely cares about either of those things. The hardware is just gonna go through the process of, your heap happens to be here, and your stack happens to be here. You've got a request for memory that's in the heap, it's an address that starts with one zero. So I'm just gonna go to the page frame that has that mapping. You've got a request for an address that's in the stack. All the hardware is gonna say is, it's an address that starts with one zero. I'm gonna go to the page frame that corresponds to that page number. So yes, it's possible for that to happen. It's possible, it's unlikely. It's unlikely in the sense that the address spaces that we actually have are so huge that these two things growing together is not gonna happen, that you're gonna stack overflow <laughs> before you grow a heap to be big enough that's going to get into the state of they happen to be in the same page frame. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's, a, that's also a really good question. And again, let me know if I'm wrong, but the question you're asking is, a page can either be free or not free. So either the heap will request the page first or the stack will request the page first. Okay, we have to take a step back here. 
the heap is not requesting anything, the stack is not requesting anything, the process is requesting these changes. The process says, can you please grow my heap to the operating system? The process is calling functions that make the stack bigger. The process has these allocations to it. So the process will have either allocated page two or it will not have allocated page two, whether it's because it was the, the stack that did it first or the heap that did it first. So if we go through the process of calling BRK a bunch of times and make our heap grow all the way down to here, our OS will then allocate this page to the process. When the stack starts growing up here, it's going to say, this page has been allocated to you. Congratulations, just keep working. The page and the page frame were assigned to that process. It can use it for whatever it wants. Yeah, yeah. No, it's okay. We don't have anything keeping the page in bounds. There's no. So there is a bounds, and there is a there's a base. They're implicit, though. The bounds is that all of these page frames are a fixed size, and all of these pages are a fixed size. So if this was not allocated yet, so I'm gonna undo these marks. This page is not allocated yet. If I tried to uh, request this, if I tried to go past the, the size of the page, we're going to know because I'm going to be using a virtual address that's in this range. When I do a virtual address that's in this range, my hardware will have that page table base entry that I've scrolled past there. It will have that page, ta page table base register. It knows where the page table is. It will look up that entry in the page table and say it's not allocated. And then we fault. This is actually a segmentation fault now. This is what segmentation fault actually means now. You've gone past, you, you tried to access a page that hasn't been allocated to your process yet. There's no page table entry for this, for this process, segmentation fault. Did, did that answer your whole question? Because I feel like there was more and I might've just digressed and, okay. <laughs> The heap is no longer relevant to that part of the discussion. All that matters is that we have addresses that start with 0, 1, or 0, 0, or 1, 0, or 1, 1. When we get to that point of virtual addresses, all our hardware is going to do is look up that address in this mapping. It doesn't know if it's the heap or the stack. It just looks it up in this mapping, and it's either allocated or it's not allocated. There is a page frame or there isn't a page frame for it to translate to a physical location. Whether it's the heap, the stack, or the code segment is kind of irrelevant. It doesn't know anything about those anymore. The operating system doesn't really need to know about that either. It kind of does. It kind of does in reality, but in like taking a look at this in principle, it doesn't need to know about that anymore. It doesn't need to know that the code segment is there. It doesn't need to know that the stack segment is there. It doesn't need to know that the heap segment is there. We saw that it does when we looked at those mappings, but it doesn't actually need to know about those things for doing virtual to physical address translations. Does, does that answer your question? Okay, okay. It's weird. I know it's weird to just suddenly like, Code heap and stack, code heap and stack, code heap and stack. Okay, fuck code heap and stack. They're just gone. We don't care about them anymore. We're just looking at virtual to physical. I know that it's weird to just drop that idea after you've been beaten with it for so long. But with this, 
In principle, we don't need to know about those things anymore. We just need to know which pages and page frames have been allocated and which have translations and which don't have translations. Okay, I really want to answer your questions. I also am aware of the time. So I will answer your questions, but I'm aware of the time. <laughs> so you, up here first. A process doesn't necessarily always have four pages. This is just in our example. We've got an address space that's 64 units. We've got four pages, so each page is uh, 16 units in size. Yeah. It's possible, yes. Page frames. The pages will be con contiguous. The pages will be contiguous. So in our virtual address space, it's always going to have this layout, code first, heap next, stack at the bottom. Our virtual address space will always look like this. And we confirmed this when we ran that process that printed out these addresses. My Linux system here is using paging right now. That is running on this system right now. My virtual address space still looks like this, but in physical memory, the heap for a process might be like, what have we got here? The heap for a process here for page one is over here at page frame zero. The code segment is down here at page frame two. They're not contiguous in any way. They're not physically next to each other. Those just happen to be the, the page frames that were free when the process started. Do you have a question still? There's not so much base and bounds anymore. The base is going to be, this is the page that we're looking at, and the bounds is, this is how big all pages are. They all have the same bounds. They all have the same size in total. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm going to uh, skip over here to my summary, and I'm going to say we've gone from base and bounds to segmentation to paging, and they're all kind of like, they all have different things that are okay about them. Base and bounds is just bad, straight up bad. Segmentation is less bad, but it's still not very good. Paging is kind of like the solution that everyone has agreed upon. This system that's in front of me right now is using paging. This is an actual real thing that's going on. Your Mac OS systems are using paging. Your Windows systems are using paging. They're all using paging. Paging is a good general purpose solution. It works across different operating systems. Your processor, your MMU, your AMD, your Intel CPU, I'm not really sure about ARM, but your AMD and Intel CPU for sure know what page tables look like. They have to know what page tables look like to be able to decode page table entries. Windows, Mac OS, and Linux all have to use the same structure because it's the hardware that's telling us what the structure of those things is supposed to be. We're going to answer those other parts tomorrow. I hope you have a good night, and I'll see you tomorrow for the last class. Bye, everybody.